Welcome to our study on Sonship Prayer. This is session four. <laughs> I know last week I taped the sessions for three and four. And um, what happened was both of our recorders went on the fritz. And we didn't get any of session four last week. And only one of them caught session three. And I didn't want us to leave that out of the taping. But you won't have to endure session four exactly the same. What I did is I went in and I kind of reworked some of that material. And so I do want to, so you're going to hear some things that you heard last week. I don't think it'll be bad for us to do that. But we really need to capture it so that we have it. Otherwise, there's going to be a big chunk of information that's missing out of that. So, just to let you know, this first session today is session four, which although we did it last week, we didn't, ha uh, we didn't capture it. Here's the second thing, and this is good news. I have them all right up here. I'm going to hand them out at the end. And, and, um, and you have notes. I guess you see those notes are pretty hefty this time compared to normal. But look, remember I told you that we have two, two sections to this. We kind of have classroom, and we learn the information. But we have to have a way to take that information and take it into the laboratory and see it work. So here's what I'm going to start producing for us. Lab notes. And so you're going to get these each time. And this one, the, little, the bottom will always tell you what the lab notes are about. So you'll always just be able to look at the front and tell. And on the inside, here's what I've done. I've taken, first of all, I've explained it all right here. Here's how the lab notes work. And the answer key is in here. Because what I want you to do is to be able to take what we've learned and actually practically apply it. So it doesn't just stick up here as information, but it translates you know, into inner man working. So every day, I have three little questions and then a way to put them into practice. The questions are to get you to thinking about a specific area. So for instance, on Monday, that's about prayer and suffering. This is about your suffering. And so how prayer works with that. On Tuesday, it's about prayer and suffering. But it's about praying for someone else who is suffering. So that's a little different. On Wednesday, it's about searching our heart. And so we'll talk about that. On Thursday, it's prayer and godly labor. In other words, how do we determine through our prayer what it is that we're going to labor with our Father in? And then on Friday... <laughs> I forgot to change the heading. <laughs> eh, the heading is wrong. It should be prayer and the ministry of the Spirit. So anyway, even though the title is wrong, the questions are right. And then there's a little place on the back that if you want to use it for notes, there's a blank spot back there you can use for notes. So this is something... Now look, here, here's what I want you to understand. I'm not, if, you, if you take this home... This is just to help you implement what you're learning. That's all it is. If you take it home and pitch it in a pile and never look at it, that's up to you. This is sonship. You got to do what you do because you want it. Not because I'm, gonna, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask anybody who did it. We're not it's not like a homework assignment. You're not turning them in. Nobody's ever going to see it but you. But I do know that we have folks here and folks in Glen Rose, and I'm sure many folks that are listening that do want to say, I, I want to take what we're learning and implement it. So as we go through the notes today, by the way, I tell you the answer key in the front, because if you're looking at these questions and you say, I don't rem I, I kind of know, but I, I'm not sure I really remember that right, I give you every day and where to go in your notes to the very page number to find the answer. So see how nice I am? See, I'm not just going, this is back in session two. I'm actually telling you the page number it's on in your notes. Do you realize I work my fingers to the bone? Okay, see, there's one any tears in your... I'm suffering, exactly, thank you. Okay, so I'll hand these out at the end, not because you can't have them now, but because I don't, 
I don't want you to be tempted to look at this and go, what do I need to know? Because I'm going to point it out to you as we go through. As a matter of fact, while we're going through the lesson today, I'm going to say, this is an area that you're going to encounter in your lab notes. So that you'll understand, oh, okay, I'm, you know, so you'll know those are the areas that we're going to be putting into practice during the week. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's, um, let's uh, get back to this now in session four. I, I told you before that in order for prayer to be correct, it has to be in line with God's purpose for the dispensation of grace. And it has to be in accordance with His will. Now, when we talk about His purpose, in other words, it's what God is doing in this dispensation of grace. There is something He wants done. And we have to be able to think about what that is in a short, clear statement. What is it God is doing in this dispensation of grace? If you said that to somebody, our prayer needs to be in accordance with God's purpose or what He's doing in the dispensation of grace. How would you characterize that? What would you say God is doing in this dispensation of grace? And I realize there's going to be several right answers here. Working in our inner man. See, that's good. God is, let's put it up here. He is working in our inner man. Anybody else? That's good enough. If we left it right there, it would be fine. But I want, I want to make sure you've got some thinking going on here. Oh, okay. All right. He's, um, educating us in, can I just sum this up? Educating us in His wisdom. Can we say it that way? All right, what else is he doing? You know these answers. I know you do. Preparing us for our, for our work. <laughs> That's really good. All right. He's pre pre preparing us. I'm going to use the word that Paul uses later in his epistles. He's preparing us for our vocation out in the creature. In eternity. That's great. Y'all are really doing good. Y'all are batting a thousand here. What else? Now I know you're looking, you're going, oh, okay, there's not many left now. But really, there are things. Just think. He's putting his power on display. That is really good. Am I too low right here, Mark? No. Okay. All right, what else is he doing? Long suffering. <laughs> he is being long suffering. I'm not going to deny that. All right, something else he's doing in this dis dispensation of grace. There's a lot. Okay, look, that's good enough. Let me just mention a few things to you. And I know you know this. He is conforming us to the image of His Son, right? And He is transforming us by the renewing of our mind, right? And He is using those things which would, would be detrimental to us. He is using those things to our benefit, right? So see, there's a whole lot of things that we could say. These are great, and I, these are the only ones we're going to put up for now. But this, this, is what is, this is in accordance with his purpose. He is putting something on display. And that's a huge deal. He is preparing us for eternity. That's a big deal. He is educating us his wisdom. If he wasn't doing that, if we, none of that other would be working. He's, and he's doing all of that work in our inner man. This is wonderful. Okay, so now let's talk about his will. I don't know if I mentioned this to you last week or not, but if you're going to pray and it's going to be in accordance with His purpose, can we just apply this for a minute 
Let's do a little lab session here. Then if prayer is in accordance with God's purpose, then we realize it's going to be prayer that concerns something in our inner man. Because that's the more important thing. And remember what Paul said? Though our outer man perish, the inner man is renewed day by day. That's, that inner man is going to be strengthened. All right. Uh, if we're going to pray in accordance with his purpose, then we are going to be praying about that education that we're getting. That we, need to, that we either need to know something or we need to operate out of what we know. The practical application of this one is to understand that the things that we're praying about right now and putting into practice, are the, it's the very skill set we're going to take with us into the creature. That's, in fact, that's the only thing you're going to take with you when you leave. That's going to be it, other than a case of Dr. Pepper's. Everything else is staying. All right? Number four, that display of his power you know what? We could have branched this off. I was just sure Karen was going to say he's making an impact on Satan's realm because I've heard her say that a couple of times before. That, I mean, that's part, I mean, he is making that display of his power and he is negatively impacting the realm of our adversary. Satan doesn't like to see this kind of thing going on. Okay, there's the practical application of the purpose. Now when we talk about his will, Remember, I told I did talk about this. I said there's two ways that people think about God's will. Now, here it is. I used to pray this way. This is the way I was taught in church, and when I went to Bible school, this is the way I was taught. That you have, in this Bible, His revealed will, and then you also have, this is the way, this is the way I, it was always taught to us, in God's will, you have, you don't need to write this down because this won't be right. You have His revealed will, and that comes out of your Bible. And then you have His perfect will, and that perfect will is the, all the things that are not found in your Bible, but they're the things that you think you need to do in accordance with His will. And that would be questions like, um, who am I going to marry? Uh, which school am I going to attend after uh, high school? Uh, which job uh, should I take? Uh, where should I live? Uh, all those kinds of questions. Even in the midst of everyday life, there's little subcomponents of all of that. And we, act, and we say, God's perfect will, see, that gets, that gets revealed to us somehow through a process. In the old way of thinking... How did we determine God's will? Someone says, I just don't, you know what, I got this offer, but if I, if I do that, I've got to move off to such and such, and I don't know if I ought to stay here and do this, or if I ought to move off. And in the old days, you know what I would have said? I would have said, well, make a list of pros and cons, you know, either way. If I stay here, what's all the good things, the bad things? You move off, what's the good things, the bad things? What's important to you? You know, we always looked at it like that. And there's other ways too. But then when you get into, you know, the way we were taught, they would say, oh, there's a way to, there's a way to find God's will. And there was a little... <laughs> okay, all right. The first, I, that's it. So the first thing you're doing is you were looking for a sign. That's right. What else was part of the process of finding God's will? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, let me get this one down. Prophecy. What else, Mark? Oh, throw out a fleece. Oh, you know what that, everybody knows what throwing out a fleece is, right? You know, you, got, you can kind of do it like this. Okay, God, if you, if you want me to go, and then you'd set the parameters for that, uh, let, let the guy call me again, and, and then I'll know it's your will. Oh, that, and, and by, okay, now we're going to, okay, and that's make a deal, right? Okay, yeah. Now, in, in the, the fleece thing is very interesting because you know where we, why we call it that? Right, because Gideon, he, remember he, he was going to put out a fleece and he said, let the dew be all around, but don't let it be on the fleece. And so God did it. And then the next time he put, he said, but then he wasn't sure. Uh, so he put the fleece out again and said, this time let the dew be just on the fleece and not on the ground. And God did it. That's an Israel's program, right? 
So you, so you see, a prayer that put out a fleece or gave us a sign or was part of prophecy, which it all had to do with Israel's program, would not be in accordance with what God is doing in this dispensation of grace, right? So there's a couple of other things. What were some of the other steps about finding God's perfect will? Oh, okay. All right, you'd have to pray, and then you'd look for a peace. Let me tell you a story about a, a, a good friend of mine that I've known for a really long time. Can I do that? <laughs> I was going to throw Mark under the bus. Hey, back when I called him up the first time about sonship, you know, and was just trying to explain it to him. He was going through a very difficult time. Really, I can't throw him under the bus. And one of the first things he said to me was, well, you know what, here's what I've done. And he was explaining all this stuff. And he said, I know it's God's will because I've got a peace about it. And I just went, okay. And I just left it alone. Because, he, I mean, you know what, he's my friend. He's going through a difficult time. I'm not his tutor and governor, no matter what he knows or doesn't know. And... Um, you know, and look now. Now we all have to put up with him. You see? I mean, I tried to leave it alone, but no. Okay. So, but we counted on that, didn't we? There's one more that I can think of right off the top of my head that we don't have on the list yet. Anybody can think of the other step? Well, let's go back to some verses in the Old Testament. In a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Boy, we want, to, we, we, we want to go to some godly, spiritual people and ask them what they think God you know, wants me to do. You know. The only problem is, if you talk to six people, there you go. And so, the, this was the... This, this, and, and actually, you know what we were actually counting on at the end of all of this? Some kind of inward impression that we were going to, I, I, I feel like I need to do this. All of these things, all of these things right here are not in accordance with what God is doing in the dispensation of grace. The questions that we ask about these things and all the other things that we could list here are really not prayer issues. They are what? what he, uh, they are questions. What did you say? Wishes. Wishes, okay. But, but, as, but, but for us as sons, who you're going to marry is not about you asking God who that is. That's not a prayer issue. It's a what? It's a these are all These are all decisions that you make as a son. You say, well, how am I going to make a wise decision? Well, aren't you being educated in his wisdom? That's what this whole thing is about. So that you are making wise decisions. In fact, you'd be thinking about each of those things just like your father, and you would be going through that process his way, you could come to the same conclusion. That's what that was about. Now, that's the old way of doing that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mark that out. Because this, these are not the issues of, you know, finding God's will like... And we used to say that in the old days. Do you realize how scary that is? God has one person picked out for you to marry in the whole world. Wow. Talk about needle in a haystack. He has one place he wants you to live. He has one job he wants you to work. He has one. What are the odds of getting all of that right? Hey, by the way, where you live, that would depend upon your parents of getting it exactly right. Because where you got born is where they are. And guess what? Where they were would depend upon the. Do you know what? If all of that was true, there is nobody where they're supposed to be. Oh, pre okay, thank you. Okay, and if you're a Calvinist, I guess you got it. Okay. So, this is not it. These are not prayer issues, and we don't do these things. You know what? There is liberty, right? So there you are. So you know what you have? You have the will of God 
revealed in the Word of God. You say, but everything that is His will is revealed in there? That's right, because you know what His will is? For you to be conformed to the image of His Son. And, and, that, and, and as long as that gets done, you'll answer all of these questions out of godly wisdom. Do, does that make sense to everybody? Do you see that? Okay, nobody sees that. Okay. I'm just saying. Th these are not the things in accordance with our program. I, I, I do think you see. So, where, now the Bible, I mean, we talked about, hey, the fleece, that's back with Gideon. So, if we're going to just, are we just going to go through the whole Bible then and find His will? Where will you find God's will to you as a member of the body of Christ? Romans to Philemon. It looks like Philippians. Romans to Philemon. There's God's will. Because His will is going to be revealed to you. In other words, that is written in His Word. God's will, look, I'm going to say it like this. For me to say, I'm, I'm, I, I just want to know God's will. I'm looking for God's will. I'm praying for God's will. Is a little bit of an insult when His will has already been written down right here. It, I say it's a little bit of an insult. Nobody means it to be, but it is, it's, it, it's a little bit of a slap at what God has done. It's, a, it's, an, it's an understanding that's not accurate. If someone were to do to us what we unintentionally do to Him by statements like that, we would take umbrage at that. We would feel like we've been totally misrepresented. And so I'm just trying to show you, no, God's not mad at you. He's not going to punish you. But you have to understand that to be able to pray intelligently, it is going to be in accordance with His purpose, and it's going to be in accordance with His will. And everything that's written in Romans to Philemon has one purpose in mind. And it's this first one, to build your inner man. It's going to do all of those other things. It's going to educate you for eternity. It's going to put His wisdom in you. It's going to display His power. All of that's going to be done. But everything that Paul wrote to us and about us is to build our inner man. And so everybody gets it now that, that your prayer life, if it's going to be right, is going to line up with these two things. And that's why I was saying to you the last time, we didn't go to this kind of detail, but I just wanted you to see that I'm just not using words here when I say our prayers have to be in accordance with His purpose and will. There's really some thought behind that. I just wanted to expand that so that we could get it. Now we learned back in Romans chapter 8 that God's, what, what His uh, that will was originally. Take a look at this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. He had a purpose in all of this from the beginning. For whom He did foreknow. Now we went through this back in Romans 8, so I'm not going to go through this whole verse again. But I do want to look at that highlighted part. For when, it, when as soon as he talks about that, and by the way, do all things work together for good? That's what they're intended to do, and and that is for that is in accordance with his purpose, because for whom he did foreknow, he's not talking about he looked down through time and he saw Bob and Norma and and Bertha and Carrie. He's not he's not doing that. He is talking about looking at what he wants to have, sons and daughters, and what those sons and daughters will look like. I mean, what they'll, I mean, he's looking at us and saying, they're going to be like my son. They're going to be conformed to the image of my son. So God, from the very beginning, he had a plan, did he not, to reconcile the earth? He's doing that through the nation of Israel. And, but when he talks about the heavens... He's got to have a plan to reconcile them. That is the body of Christ. 
And so, when he says, I foreknew, foreknow means to know ahead of time, right? In other words, he had, all of this is according to a blueprint. From the very beginning, God had a blueprint laid out, and He not only knew He wanted to have sons and daughters so that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren, but He also knew the process that it was going to take to get us there. All of this was laid out ahead of time. He's not doing anything on the fly. In other words, God's not looking at something that you go through. Uh, something happens to Sarita. God's not going like, oh, well, you know what? I didn't think about that. So I guess what I need to do is I need to think about what I can do now. There is nothing any of us could ever go through. What Milt's going through up in the hospital? God's already arranged for how sonship handles all of that. There's nothing we're going to go through that, will, that wasn't in the original blueprint. Okay, now with that in mind... What I want to do is to say that, oh, uh, okay, I'm way ahead of this, so I kind of I did all of that stuff. All right, so let's, let's get back to the prayer issue now. So if prayer, and that's really the overarching issue here, if prayer is in accordance with His purpose and His will, and He knows the process that He's going to use to get us there, tell me an ingredient in the process. What is one of the ingredients that is going to actually work in your inner man, that's going to work to conform you? It's the whole reason He didn't redeem your body when you got saved. It's the whole reason that He starts talking about this issue at the beginning in Romans 8, as soon as He tells you you're an adopted son. Yeah, it's the suffering. Because our prayers are tied directly to suffering. If God didn't want you to suffer, you know what He'd done when you got saved? He'd redeemed your body. Hasn't everything that needs to happen in the death, burial, and resurrection, hasn't that all been provided for already? Sure. Did He not redeem his, our body because He didn't have the power to do it? No, it's because He chose not to do it. Remember in Romans 12, 1, that you're to present your body a living sacrifice. He realizes what this body is going to go through. But here's what He's doing. He's tying, <coughs> he's tying prayer to suffering because those things that would be detrimental to us are now actually going to work to our benefit. All things work together for good. And that good is not that, oh, it's all going to turn out okay, but it is in the sense of what it works in our inner man. Even if what you go through is unto death, that works a, a degree of glory in your inner man. Now, look, you can die from the sufferings of this present time by just doing stupid stuff. I've almost killed myself a couple of times doing stupid stuff when I was in college. But the policy of evil can't kill you until you're an advanced son. And do you know what? There's a whole lot of work that gets done in that. So this, this thing is tied to our suffering. This is the part that I, I wanted to, to, to get us to, to here because, Romans 8, 16... The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Twice, as soon as you're told about being an adopted son back in 14 and 15, and now you're talking about being heirs and joint heirs with Christ, you're introduced to this idea of suffering. Why do you think that as soon as he talks about your justification and the first components of your sanctification, this is the very next thing he takes out of the box and lays in front of you? Because, you, he is, because of what he's not doing. 
He's not intervening in those physical circumstances. And you don't want to be looking at Old Testament scriptures and scratching your head and saying, how come God's not delivering me from this? Or how come God let this happen to me? Because that's some of the question, wasn't it? How many people have had something happen detrimentally and they thought, why is God doing this to me? Is He punishing me? Is He trying to tell me something? Is He trying to teach me something? What's going on here? But see, they'll never get those kinds of answers. And so they go to their preachers and their preachers will tell you, well, you're, you, you may be going through this problem because you have sin in your life. And then they confess all their sin. And then, and then it doesn't work. And they come back and the preacher says, you have secret sins. And they use that terminology. I have secret sins. Well, how do I get rid of secret sins? Well, God knows what they are. You just have to ask Him to reveal those things that He knows are secret. This is a dangerous game. And if you get that solved out, you know what the problem could be? You don't have enough faith. And then if you get that one solved, it could be a generational curse. Something your great-grandfather did. And now you're... Bit, you, know what, you know what this is? This is a shell game. Because there's no real answer in all of this, you have to create a system where you're always moving from one thing to another. You're always sliding the shells around and nobody can ever find the little marble under the shell. Let's go back to what Paul is doing. What Paul is doing is taking this condition that we're in now and he's letting you know. By the way, if you look at that, is there anything in there that indicates to you God's going to deliver you from the sufferings themselves? You don't ever get that indication. In fact, when he comes along, if we had read this, really we already knew things ahead of time. But if we had come through this and we had read Romans 8 and said we're joint heirs, if so be that we suffer with him the natural reaction to that would have been, wait a minute, you mean I've got to suffer to be a joint heir? Now you see why there is a, correct, a, a connection to suffering here. Because it's through those sufferings that God is now going to do something in our inner man. You know why? Because that's when we're weak. And Paul said, when I am weak, yeah, he is strong. My strength is not in me. My strength is in Him. These are things I can't do. I can't. You can't turn that into something different, but He can. And that's what He intends to do. And we have to start looking at it. By the way, can I just, I just want to, I just want to say this. There are some things that we will suffer that we can fix. They may not be fixed immediately, but we won't go through them our whole life. Everybody knows this. You ever had the flu? You were doing some physical suffering when that was going on, but you didn't have it forever. Sometimes there are other circumstances. We go through it for a while, and then we can fix it. So do you know what? We, we, we don't say, well, I'm not going to fix it because God's doing something with my suffering. He's not asking you to look for suffering. I mean, that'd be like me putting my hand on a hot stove and going, ow, that's burning me, but guess what? It's conforming me to that. No. You know what you do if you touch the hot stove? Your body knows what to do. Get that hand off of there immediately. It's damaging the body. But you know what you do? If you can, you remove it. If you can't, now you patiently endure, right? If you can't, now, while you don't, when you can't, until you can fix it, you're going to go through this to the glory of your Father. Now, I just want to say that because some people would, would take my words and make it sound like, oh, well, you know what? We don't ever try to get out of any suffering. Well, of course you do. Uh, Paul even talks about that. We'll see that when we look at some verses in 1 Timothy. We won't see them today. But Paul talks about those kinds of issues. So when he talks about the sufferings of this present time, he is telling us right off the bat that we are going to be suffering. And now look at this next verse. So not only do we have this now, in Romans chapter 8, here in verses uh, 17 and 18, but now, let me skip you down, 
and show you this next one. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. And so now we have something sitting over here in Romans chapter 8 in verse 26 that says the Spirit is going to help our infirmities. Well, when it, it, there's an also there. I'm not taking the time right now to go back and see what the first thing was. There is something that is done for us that helps us. But then, in addition to that, likewise, the Spirit also is going to do something. And so, what is it that the Spirit is going to do to help us in these sufferings, in these times of infirmities? Well, remember, the Spirit is going to help us, but watch this carefully. Now, I'm about to tell you something that's going to show up in your lab notes. What the Spirit does to help you is not automatic. I say that because what the Spirit is doing is there is something He's doing to help you, but you have to respond properly to what He's doing. In other words, every John Doe out there doesn't automatically get this done. You have to know something. And that's what the Spirit is doing. He is causing you to know something. So let's talk about this ministry of the Spirit. The Spirit is causing you to know something. And um, by the way, how important this is. I, I, I should have said this and I didn't do it. This area of suffering. Do you remember I told you that there's a number of doctrines that are the pet doctrines that Satan loves to attack. And Paul highlights those with a particular wording. Does anybody remember what that wording is? Brethren, I would not have you ignorant of, and then he tells you what it's about. Suffering is one of those don't be ignorant doctrines. Because this is an area that Satan is having a heyday with people over. And so what he's doing is he is, he is confusing them, corrupting their understanding, getting them moving off in the wrong direction, and Paul knows this is an easy area to do it. So this is one of those highlighted doctrines that we really have to have an understanding of. Okay, now, by the way, if we don't, Paul says Satan will gain an advantage of us. And we don't want that to happen. Okay, so th these circumstances that create our suffering, when we pray... We're not asking God to change the circumstances. By the way, it doesn't matter if you do, He's not going to do it. But we don't, if we're going to pray in accordance with His purpose and will, we're not asking God to change the circumstances. What, what are we asking Him to do? Yeah. The change isn't happening in our circumstances. The changes are going to be happening in us. And the ministry of the Spirit there... The ministry of the Spirit now is the first all, give us some knowledge of some things. Why is that the first thing? Because if you don't know anything, you have nothing to follow up with. Exactly. You've got it, because many of the things he's telling us are things we wouldn't be thinking on our own. And so what he's doing is he's giving us some information. And, 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 it, and then we're going to operate based on that information. You've done this plenty of times before. In fact, you did it to become a believer. You were faced with some information about not just that Jesus died on the cross, but what He was offering in that death on the cross. And even though you never saw Him in His earthly ministry, you understood about what he had done on that cross, and it was as applicable for you today as it was for someone sitting back there. And so you know what you did? You placed your faith in him as your all-sufficient Savior. And once you did that, that changed everything. But if you didn't have that knowledge, what would you have done? 
See? But because you knew something, you did something. And now, we're in the midst of our suffering, the ministry of the Spirit is going to help us. It's going to, be some, it's going to provide something that we need. And what we need is to know some things. And that's the job of the Spirit. So, if we were... In fact, let me, I've got this up here. Now, I put this up because this is one of those aha moments. And here we go. Th this is an aha moment like we covered last week. Or no, two, two, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, remember I told you, uh, let me tell you a story. Let me, let me do it like this. I can remember in Glen Rose the first time we weren't talking about prayer. But there was something we were looking at that was very closely connected to it. And so I introduced a statement about God not changing our physical circumstances, but doing a work in our inner man. And then someone asked a question about that, which would be pretty natural. And so I expanded on that answer. At the break, I can remember about ten people coming up and saying, and they asked me a very difficult question, and I didn't want to answer it. Not because there wasn't an answer, but because they didn't know enough to comprehend the answer. So they said this, because there was a member of, the, there, was, there, was, there was someone who had come to that study before we ever got into sonship and then stopped coming. And they were in the hospital. And they were saying, then how do we pray for this person? But that person didn't know any of that doctrine. You know the answer to that question. How, 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 uh, not, not how, can you pray for that person to have all those inner man things? I mean, I'm not saying do you want them to. Of course we want them to. But the only way you know, look, let me back up again. One more time. How do you get strengthened in your inner man? We're going to look at that verse in Ephesians today. How do you get strengthened in your inner man? That's right. Because of what, something you are made to know. And when you believe that, and you conduct yourself in accordance with that, it becomes a reality. Sorry, I'm going to back up one more. When I was a kid, we uh, used to go to a place called Crystal Lake. And it was a great swim. had a big, kind of like a catwalk that went way out in the water. And it was about four feet wide, I guess. You could walk way out and come all the way back around. And the inside of that was the kids' swimming area. And so you could put your kids in there, and parents could go and sit all along that catwalk or be out in the water or whatever. And then they also had this other really neat thing. At the far end, I, we called it a lake, but it wasn't really huge like a lake. But at the far end over there, there was this huge tower that went up, and there was a trolley line. And, then, and that thing came down, and it was fastened to something way under the water here at the other end. And it had handles. And what people do is they go up, now let's go up, and they get that, and they pull that thing up. And then you get a hold of it, and you'd leap off the edge of that platform, and you'd just go sailing down that tri line. And what you did is, before you hit the water, you would let go and just splash into the water. So here I am, I don't know, I'm probably 10 years old. I can't reach. You know, it's at an angle, but I'm as close to the edge as I want to get, and I can't reach the trolley line. So, that my da so I beg my dad to go. And he goes, okay, go ahead. And he goes, I'll wait for you down here at the bottom. And I'm going, so you're not going with me? He goes, no, I'll wait for you at the bottom. I'll just swim out and wait for you. Oh, now I'm having second thoughts. And he's going, it'll be fine. Do you see everybody else doing it? Yeah. Can you hold yourself up? Well, yeah. Then go do it. Uh. So I get up there. 
And you know, while I'm up there in line, I wasn't going to tell you this part. I was letting people go ahead of me. You know why? I'm thinking about it. I'm a little scared, and I'm thinking about it. I see it. It looks like everybody's yelling like crazy. Yeah! They're coming down that thing, and I'm thinking, well, that looks fun. But now that I'm up there, and, and it looks like it's forever to the bottom of this tower, oh, man. So these teenagers, they go, I go, y'all want to go? And they go, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh. So I get up there, and I'm trying to reach up and get this deal, and they go, here. And one of them goes, here, I'll get it for you. And he grabs it, and he's pulling, pulls it up. I get a hold of the handles. The guy kind of, the handles are hanging down, so I got a hold of the handles. And so here I go, and I step off of this thing, and man, I'm whizzing down across there, and I'm going, how when, now, where am I supposed to let go of this thing? You know, all this is flashing through your mind. And I don't know how far. I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty close to the water. I let go. I splash into the water. When I come up out of that water, I'm going, I look at my dad, and I'm going, I'm going again. And now I don't want to get off of it because I realize what this is. Now, you know what? That, that knowledge of knowing what to do and how that worked, I mean, all of that, yeah, even with that, it was a little trepidation at first. But once you do it, and then you just do it, and it's, now, we've all been through stuff like that. The ministry of the Spirit is to tell us something, but he, His telling you alone won't do it. You have to take what He tells you, and the first thing is you have to believe it, and then you have to act on it, right? Now look what this is. I'm going to put these on here because this is great. And now I'll let you go for the break because I know the clock went off. You have to believe it and then you have to act on it. Do you know what I just put up there on the board? Do you realize what those two things are? You do know. But I don't know if you made the connection. Because I believe it. Now if I believe it, don't I need... I also need to do something else here. I, 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 don't only have, I have to, I should have put this in first, but I didn't. I have to understand it, don't I? In other words, what I'm being told, I have to understand it, and then I have to believe it's true. Because if I don't believe it's true, I'm never going to do what? I'm never going to act on it. Right. Never going to do it. And so, because I understand it, and I believe it, you know what that is? That is the godly thinking. I understand what He has taught me. And I believe it. That's the godly thinking. The acting, what is that? That's, that's the godly... That's the godly... It's going to start out as godly living. In other words, I'm going to take that thing I now believe... And I'm going to start acting on that. And then, once I get that, you know what those qualify me to do? Labor with Him. Because you know what? I've, I understand it, and I've done it, and now I've done it enough. We're kind of like me, going back up, until finally my mother goes, Michael, do not go get back on that thing again. You know, it's almost like teaching a kid to walk. Come on, walk to mommy, walk to mommy. And when we spend the next, you know, 18 years going, sit down and be still. It's teaching them to talk, and then you go, shut up. Eat, quit talking. Well, once, what, th that's what these are. So he's teaching us something because that, that has to happen for godly thinking to take place and godly living to take place. And we need that so that we can labor with Him. So does, it, does everybody see that? See how this works? So the, the ministry of the Spirit is not, let me change your circumstances. The ministry of the Spirit is, you're going to go through these circumstances. And we looked at those verses. Oh, I, I, I was going to give you the other aha moment. And I didn't. I gave you the first one. But this is this one. We'll do it when we come back. How about that? Because that aha moment was, oh, I didn't finish it. I have to finish it. Don't, are we still going? Yes. Okay, good. So here it is. 
This thing I told you a few weeks ago, the, what the folks in Glenrose came and asked me, because here's a person sitting in the hospital, and they don't know any, they haven't come to any knowledge. They don't realize God's working in their inner man. They don't realize that God can strengthen their inner man. They don't realize God can give them patient endurance through this doctrine, through, through the knowledge. They don't know any of it. And because they don't know about it, what? They can't, uh, they can't access it because they don't know about it. Now, does the world offer some kind of, you know, peace and all of that? Of course it does. And they can do that. But what this is doing, they can't do because they don't know it. So that first aha moment was, I can't pray for them to be strengthened in their inner man because they don't know about being strengthened in their inner man. They, before I can pray that for them, what needs to happen? They have to know something. So if I really want for them to be strengthened in their inner man, what do I need to do? I need to introduce them to what they need to know. Exactly. That makes sense? And so that, that moment, and then I put that very bluntly about two weeks ago. I said, if somebody doesn't know, you can't ask God to give it to them because they don't, ha they don't even know about it. it. Remember, we equated it with a kid not knowing the answers to his history exam. Can you pray for God to give him the answers? No, because he needs knowledge, right? Same thing. Here's the next... Oh, I was going to do this one after the break. Okay, so I have a second aha moment for you. And I'll give it to you after.